the full moon of October is known as the Hunter's Moon. This October, the Hunters will be out in force, filling the hungry sky. And you are the midnight snack. <laughs> this overly dramatic cinema trailer is from the 1999 movie Bats. It's your typical horror flick. You know, a swarm of genetically mutated bats terrorise an unsuspecting small town in Texas. This Halloween season, you may have already put up scary bat decorations around your house. But even beyond the scary, bats just aren't viewed very well in our culture. Have you ever seen a bat? They're hideous. Lifeless beady eyes, clawed feet, huge grotesque wings. Wings! <laughs> They give you rabies, you know. He's Ventura. He wasn't exactly good bat PR either. But there are those who think very differently about bats, and they're constantly fighting the myths. Bats have this scary, sinister mythology that, you know, it's just sort of always that they were dark and dirty and mysterious because they were hidden. Mysterious, yes. But bats are also really fascinating all 1,400 species of them. From the bumblebee bat that weighs less than a penny to the flying fox with a six-foot wingspan. And these creatures provide important ecological services for humans, like eating 1,200 mosquitoes a night, for starters. So, this Halloween, let's peer into the dark and separate fact from fiction about these wonderful winged mammals of the night. From KUOW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild! Too much? <laughs> Lots of people are a little weirded out by bats, but I have a neighbour who loves them, and I wanted to know why. Yeah, so what, what are we looking at here? <laughs> uh, multiple bat structures. Um, when I moved in here, I had bats in the attic of my house, and I could never figure out how they were getting from the attic into the main house, which they did regularly. This is my neighbour, Tricia Otto. She lives over the hill from me on 100 acres of forested land. She called to introduce herself recently, and one of the first things she talked about was her bats. Years ago, she had bats in her attic, so she built a few bat houses on her property to give the bats somewhere to roost besides her home. But it quickly grew into something of an obsession for her. But I must have 40 bat houses of one kind or another. Wow. So that's quite a, quite a lot. I'm used to seeing gardens full of bird houses, but not bat houses. Some of Trisha's are plastic tubes, different sizes and even different colours. Others are wood and lie flat against her barn wall with little narrow gaps for bats to crawl up into. Trisha has become somewhat of a bat expert. I learned that the more structures I had available to bats, the more likely I was to have a nursery colony. I'm also with Tricia to look for bats, and I'm really hoping we'll get lucky. We walk down to a creek on her property. It's surrounded by a wetland, tall green reeds. There are a couple of wood ducks sitting on the water. We've got all the makings for great bat habitat here, and now, now we just need some bats. Yes, bats. <laughs> Do you, have, do you have your bat detector with you? I have my bat detector with you. Okay. With me, it, it is... A bat detector is a pretty amazing gadget. Bat vocalizations, the sounds they make while echolocating or communicating, are so high in frequency, humans can't hear them. So a bat detector lowers the pitch of the sound to make it audible. Trisha's trusty unit is from the 80s. It's like a hand-sized box, like something out of an early Star Trek episode. Okay, I'm going to turn on my bat detector. We get some static, but no bat noises. 
Trisha tells me we might need the sun to go down a bit more. There's a sweet spot at twilight that bats love right before true darkness. Bats can see perfectly well. They're not blind. And uh, when there's light like this, they don't need to echolocate. They can see what they're hunting. So a bat may be out and I may hear nothing on my detector until it gets a little darker. Oh, so the bat can actually be out here hunting, but yes. not yet echolocating. Yes. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. So they do it by sight at times. Yes. As we were waiting for it to get a bit darker, Trisha tells me about the bat colony she's built here. One of the key things is having a place where the bats can care for their newborns and nurse them. All bats get pregnant at the same time in the spring, and they only have one pup per year. These bats have chosen one bat box as the birthing box in Trisha's barn, and now she has about 50 western long-eared bats that use it and give birth there every year. And underneath that box I have a, a sheet of plywood, and on the day that they all have their babies, and they all have their babies simultaneously because their reproduction is timed like that, there's a little, as their amniotic sac breaks, there's a little uh, drop of water, several drops of water, a little splat on the board beneath. So you can actually count how many babies were born that day by counting those little splats of water on the board. It's understandable why Tricia has this particularly deep interest in the reproductive physiology and behavior of bats. She's a retired obstetrician gynecologist. So the way bats have it all timed... Uh, to all have their young on the same day or within a day or two in the colony, um, it always, you know, made me think of delivering babies. You wouldn't want to deliver all those babies on the same day, <laughs> but they do. And apparently they, uh, they even have some evidence that, that bats will help each other having their young. Wow. Mm -hmm. bat, bat midwives? Bat midwives, yes. Oh. Can we try the... Dara, the come on, little fella. Where are you? Let's have a nice big brown fly by for us. That would be so nice. We spend another 20 minutes listening on the bat detector in the fading light, but the bats are quiet tonight, or more likely they've left for winter. It was fun looking, but Trisha's stories have left me wanting to know more. So I track down someone who sees bats all the time, a bat specialist, and we arrange a Zoom call. Am I sideways? You are right side up. You were originally sideways, but now... Um... <laughs> the, the new version of, of human... Jill Carpenter is a bat biologist based in Southern California, and her research focuses on bat conservation and education. Jill studied wildlife in college and got into bats for a pretty straightforward reason. But I didn't like waking up early. So the sort of birds and most of the other wildlife that other people um, were studying just didn't really appeal to me. Just, just because of waking up early, I just didn't, couldn't, couldn't do it. Jill is also a rock climber. And one day, back then, she was invited by a savvy bat biologist to help put those skills to use. She was hired to scale some cliffs to set up a series of bat detectors. It was the beginning of something special for this rock-climbing night owl. I'll tell you, by the end of that night, I was pretty hooked on, <laughs> pretty hooked on bats. I got to see them up close, uh, which most people are, are not able to do. Most people have never seen a, a bat up close. And I just thought it was really fascinating. And so I took wow. kind of a hard turn into, into bat biology. And Jill has heard a lot of bats over the years. I told her about my experience with Trisha trying to hear bats echolocating. And Jill tells me what I would have heard. So they're searching, you know, chirp, chirp, chirp. And then they might find something that is interesting. It might be their favorite type of moth. The bats send out sound waves from their nose or mouth. And if the waves bounce off something, they echo back to the bat's ears. And then the bat increases the speed of her echolocation calls. Uh, because they need more uh, real-time information about what, what it is, where it is, what's going on. And so that chirp will start to speed up. Chirp, 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 chirp. Now the bat is getting details. Size, shape, distance. 
The bat ramps up the speed of the call even more until you get what's called a feeding buzz. Because those calls are so close together that it just sort of turns into this buzzy sound. And that's the, the bat zeroing in on that insect to capture it. Using this system of echolocation, bats can detect items thinner than a human hair in total darkness. But nothing's cooler than being out at dusk and taking a bat detector and, and hearing that and then seeing a moth and seeing a bat take the moth. And uh, wow. it's, it's pretty that would cool. Be thrilling. And it's a noisy place in the skies if you're a bat. My neighbor Trisha had told me that it can sound like a war zone. Not all bats use echolocation. Some, usually the ones with big ears, just use sound, literally listening for the delicate sound of beetle footsteps on the forest floor. Bats eat a lot of insects. They're like winged pest control. Jill told me that a few years ago, her colleague got a call from a neighbour that had bats nesting on her porch. They were on the outside of her house, sort of in a crevice between her chimney and the main part of her house. And she just decided that the guano was a little messy and she didn't want to sweep it off her patio anymore. Guano is what they call bat droppings. So Jill's colleague came in and humanely removed the bats. Bats gone? Guano gone? Problem solved. But about a week after the removal, the woman called back. There was a new problem. Because apparently she would sit out on her deck some evenings, maybe, maybe every evening, and, you know, enjoy a glass of wine and, you know, sort of watch the sunset and, you know, just sort of spend some time outdoors on her patio. And I guess she had been absolutely mobbed by insects since the bats had left. The bats had been eating them, but she hadn't really put it together that the bats were doing her a service. And was wondering if she could have them back because the cleaning up the guano at that point was a small price to pay for some peace, you know, some peace and, and tranquility drinking her beverage and enjoying the sunset. I mean, that just goes to show you, you know, we, we often, because we can't see the bats, we often don't make that connection. You know, they're helping us out uh, all the yeah. time because they're the primary nocturnal predator of insects. And so they're out there doing the work and not getting any credit. <laughs> Bats eat so many insects, in fact, that they save American farmers up to $53 billion every year by protecting their crops from pests. That's $53 billion with a B. And that's not all. There's another bat benefit I wanted to ask Jill about. I love uh, tequila. <laughs> I'm, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. Many people love tequila. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more than that. Can you connect the dots for us? Sure. So bats are actually primary pollinators of the agave plant, which is where tequila comes from. And uh, if you like tequila, you, you should thank a bat. And maybe next time you have a margarita or if you like it straight, you know, then just raise your glass and toast, toast those bats. Unfortunately, it's not all celebratory drinks. There's an ironic twist to tequila's success. Overharvesting of agave for tequila could threaten the bats unless sustainable practices are adopted more. Why do you think that bats have become these scary creatures in our imaginations? In a lot of Western cultures, uh, bats have this scary, sinister mythology that, that harkens way back to probably the Middle Ages, I would guess. But, um, you know, there there's a lot of this mythology that, you know, they're blood-sucking vampires, you know, and, and maybe that came along with Bram Stoker or something like that. I guarantee medieval England was probably the source of this. I do apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, well, I appreciate it's, that. So you mentioned, you mentioned cultures, though. So was it not the same in all, in all cultures that bats are to be feared? See, that's what's interesting. So um, in, in, Chine, in Chinese culture, uh, probably more ancient Chinese culture, I don't know what the sort of modern... Uh, perception of bats is in China, but there's a lot of uh, imagery and reference to bats as uh, symbols of good luck and good fortune. You know, when when I've worked in other countries uh, doing doing work with bats, 
and there might be a rural village or something. And you show bats to those children and they're fascinated. They're not afraid because they weren't taught to be afraid. Top of the list for some people who are afraid of bats is the threat of rabies. Well, they've definitely gotten a bad rap when it comes to rabies. Um, And, you know, I, I do want to say that, you know, bats are mammals. Any mammal can can get rabies. Rabies is a very serious viral infection. Once you start showing the symptoms like fever, headache, nausea, it's almost always fatal. Although any mammal species can get rabies, bats already have this mythology around them, so they've really been demonized about this disease. To be safe, it's always best to leave wild animals alone if you find them injured or sick, bats included. Don't touch them, just call your local wildlife refuge or state wildlife department. But as always, keep the risks in perspective. There's one town has shown that coexistence is easy on a big scale. So Austin, Texas has 1.5 million bats in in a bridge downtown. I mean, it's this spectacular Mm. colony. It's a big tourist attraction. Look at that, though. Look at that. Look. Look at that. Early on when the bats moved into the bridge, there was a lot of concern that the bats would be bringing disease to the residents of Austin. Um, You know, not just rabies but you know they're just sort of thinking like the plague you know that's just sort of all yeah, of these that, that general fear yeah, yeah that's been, that's exactly been around for hundreds of years exactly yeah. so they you know they were really worried and they wanted to get rid of the bats every night at sunset these one and a half million bats in language they fly out from under the bridge to feed imagine the sight as they fill the skies but instead of fearing the bats the city of austin decided to embrace them Sometimes hundreds of people gather to watch the spectacular event. It's become a tourist attraction with bat tours and everything. And so this is almost 40 years of this, and there's never been a case of um, disease in humans from bats. And then, you know, this image of bats hasn't been helped at all by COVID-19, which is believed to have come from bats. And, and you know, how, how afraid should we be about bats in that context? We don't know how that virus was transmitted to humans. We don't know if it is the same one that came from the bats or if there's some other animal that it originated in. We, we really don't know. Bats are very good at dealing with, with viruses. COVID-19 may well have evolved in bats in Asia, but how that virus jumped to humans is still unknown. There are a lot of viruses out there, more of them than there are stars in the universe. But only a couple of hundred of these viruses can infect humans. And it's up to us as humans to remember that we're exposing ourselves to wildlife in risky ways through the things that we allow, like habitat destruction, trade of wild animals, and certain animal husbandry practices. Jill says the image of bats as dirty and full of diseases couldn't be further from the truth. Bats groom themselves. They love to be clean. In, in much the way that a cat does. You know, they're using their tongue and they're, you know, licking their fur and licking their wings and licking, you know, and they're using their feet. They might hang by one foot, which is very cute. And hmm. anyone interested can go to YouTube and find videos of, of bats grooming, which I find very soothing and interesting to watch. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, they're just sort of... I can just picture you tuning into an hour and a half of bat grooming. On yeah, YouTube. it's very relaxing. <laughs> I really want to see one in person and learn a bit more about the threats bats are facing. And my neighbour Trisha told me about a very special bat lady I need to meet. It's tough being a bat. Not just because of the bad press they get, but they face some big threats too, from habitat loss and climate change, a huge drop in insect numbers due to pesticides, and even turbines from wind farms can kill them. And they get injured all the time. There's one lady who's out to help. So the bats are in here, in the inside, and then there's a door for them to fly out. Wow. So it's pretty wonderful. Did you? It is wonderful. Did you? Is this built specially for the bats? Yes. This entire structure? This is all bat stuff. 
I'm in the backyard of Barbara Ogard in suburban Seattle. She shows me into an echoey bat house. It looks like a typical backyard shed, but there's an outdoor section covered with a mesh like a fine gauze, a place for the captive bats to fly around. Barbara has been saving bats for 30 years. I'm 80. (laughs) I've been around a long time. Barbara is part of an organisation that's dedicated to bats, called Bats Northwest. Bats are her passion. Even her Jeep licence plate says Bat Lady. And you know what it is, is that people believe a lot of the myths that go on about bats, you know, and bats fly in women's hair, bats are vampires, bats attack people. None of that is true. But, you know, people come down through the years and hear these stories and really believe them. Barbara releases most of her bats after she's rehabilitated them. She has 14 in her bathroom right now. But the ones here in the shed are too old or not well enough to be released. So Barbara uses them as educational bats to dispel the myths in an up-close and personal way. She introduces me to Robato. It's the close-up I've been waiting for. Robato? Let me see. i got to see Robato okay. here. Robato is... Um... I'm excited to see a real... Oh. I'm waking him up because he, he was... Uh, yeah. That is amazing. Yeah, and you know what? Um, his mother had him aboard a yacht, and uh, he was only two days old, and the people came down to use their boat, and the mother flew away scared and dropped him. So they brought him to me at two days old, and he doesn't know how to be a bat, so he's mine forever because, um, you know, he thinks that I'm kind of his mother. Wow, you really are. You stood in as as, as his surrogate mom. Rubato is a big brown bat. That's the actual species name, and it's the most common type of bat found in and around human populations in North America. Rubato's body is about the size of a mouse. Barbara stretches out his wing so I can get a full view of him. It's amazing. They have five fingers on each wing, and their wings are the membranes between those fingers. Is that his thumb? Yeah, right there. Wow. Just one thumb. One thumb. That that hangs on. Okay, so yeah, I know. Oh, you can hear him. Yeah, he's rebelling. He doesn't like me to do this. Although Rabato is about the size of a mouse, that's where the similarities with rodents end, bats are actually more closely related to whales than rodents. Since Rabato can't ever be returned to the wild, Barbara takes him to schools and public presentations like a kind of bat ambassador. She still has this infectious, childlike wonder about them. So, OK, you want to see clear Rabato? Oh, are you kidding me? Yes. <laughs> Barbara puts Rubato back in his clear plastic box and he climbs into the darkness under a towel. And then she pulls out Cleobatra, another one of her educational bats. She's a beauty. Oh, much smaller. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Cleobatra is a silver-haired bat. A few years ago, a farmer brought her to Barbara. Cleobatra was stuck to a fly trap that he had hanging in his barn, one of those sticky strips that hangs down. Bats chase the insects and end up stuck to the fly sheets themselves. The farmer brought the entire sheet to Barbara to see if she could save the bat, and after hours of delicate work, Barbara was able to remove Cleobatra from the glue, but sadly, the bat won't ever fly again. Cleobatra, she kind of knows I saved her, and so she's pretty laid back. Barbara picks up a pair of tweezers and grabs a wriggling mealworm. Oh, you're going you're gonna to try and feed her? Yeah, you're probably going to hear the crunch. We like sounds. The the reason you're not hearing is because these worms have been here in the cold, so they're not all crispy. <laughs> oh, that, I can hear that. That's amazing. Especially to be watching it at the same time. Wow. <laughs> it is incredible to witness this little creature eating, especially so close up. 
It makes a tiny mealworm look like a major feast, manipulating it with her tongue. And the bat's little face looks like it's in fast motion, chewing on her dinner. You go from not really seeing a bat to seeing it this close and then eating a meal like that. When the kids see that, you know how kids like gross stuff, you know, and they all just root and say, go, Cleo, you know, and stuff. And one of the things that strikes me most is that when I look at them, there's this intelligence in their eyes, like you'd see in any mammal. They can live for 20 plus years and they're constantly processing and learning. Seeing Cleobatra and Rubato at arm's length reminds me just how tiny they are. They've evolved fantastically to suit their environment over the last 50 million years, but they look so vulnerable. And they are. Not just the individuals, but sometimes entire colonies. The biggest threat to bats is currently marching across the continent. In about 2006, scientists started seeing these big bat die-offs. Caves were littered with bodies of dead bats. They noticed that a lot of these bats had this white fuzz on their, on their muzzles, around their noses, sometimes on their wings. And that's where the name white nose syndrome came from. Jill Carpenter explains white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus that grows on the bat's skin. The bacteria has been found in Europe for generations where the bats have developed an immunity, but North American bats haven't evolved a way to protect themselves. Somehow, most likely on the boots or clothing from somebody who'd been in a cave in Europe, this fungus made its way to the East Coast and started spreading through bat populations in North America. And it can kind of be likened to athlete's foot or something like that, where there's this sort of, I mean, we don't know for sure what the bats are feeling, but, you you know, there's probably this burning, itching sensation. There's definitely some kind of irritation as this fungus is growing on their their wing membranes and their noses. The fungus itself isn't fatal. The problem comes during hibernation in the winter. Bats spend the summer and fall getting as fat as they can, and these fat stores carry them through the winter. They only have enough energy reserves to wake up a couple of times during hibernation, but the irritation from that athlete's foot, that fungus on their nose, wakes them up way too many times. And they burn through their fat stores partway through the winter, and people were observing bats flying out into snowy daytime conditions. There are no no insects, you know, but they're starving and desperate. The bats starve to death because there's nothing for them to eat in the middle of winter. It's a terrible series of events. Millions of bats have died. Um, This is not inconsequential by any means. I mean, we're talking about populations that have been devastated. And this fungus has been moving west um, just relentlessly. Scientists don't know how to slow the spread. Who knows how far the deadly fungus will go and how many bats it will kill. But it seems to drive Jill even more. She hopes that the more people know about these creatures and really understand them, the more can be done to help them. I kind of have a soft spot for the underdog and and the misunderstood. Um, I've always been that way. And so when you have these amazing, intelligent, fascinating creatures, and most people are afraid of them and even repulsed by them. Jill says that if people fear or don't understand bats, then they're less likely to support their conservation and take action on things like loss of habitat. I try to take people from a place of fear and ignorance when it comes to bats and bring them to a place of curiosity. Um, You know, just sort of giving them information so that they can set that fear aside and say, wait a second, this is really interesting, this is really fascinating. And some people might never think they're cute, but they do appreciate everything else about them. Bats have quietly owned the skies at dawn and dusk on this planet for tens of millions of years. But somehow, they're still a mystery to us in many ways. But it's now they need our help. And people like Jill, Barbara and Trisha to bring them out of the darkness into our hearts and minds to celebrate these little five-fingered relatives of ours.
The wild is inspired not just by nature, but by people who work in it, love it, protect it. Here's to them and the bats with my bat-friendly tequila. Happy Halloween, everybody. If you want to know more about bats, we have more information on our website at thewildpod.org. And it is Bat Week, so check that out at batweek.org. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Rose Letwin, Jill and Scott Walker, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Mark and Rebecca Wilkins, and Bob Yellowlees. The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producer is Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. Our production team includes David Brown, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Tio Popescu, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm your host, Chris Morgan. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoy The Wild, please do ask your friends to subscribe to our podcast and give us a review. It really would help us grow. Five stars would be great. Thank you, and take good care.